Hello, everyone, and welcome to the DNSSEC Key Security Joint Webinar with ISC and TALIS. If you're joining us uh, on for the recording, this is actually a re-record of the same webinar that we did on July 8th. Unfortunately, there was a technical glitch with that webinar, and the recording did not complete successfully. So this will be a re-record. So our presentation today is going to be about 45 minutes. Um, we will not have a question and answer at the end of this webinar because, as I mentioned, this is a re-record. So, what we're unfortunately, what that means as well is that the questions that were submitted, and we had many great questions on that July 8th webinar, those were lost as well. So, if there were questions that we did not get to or you would like to have us answer uh, directly, please do contact us and there will be contact information for both TALIS and ISC um, at the end of this re-record. So our presenters today, myself, I am Eddie Winstead. I'm a senior engineer here at ISC. I've been doing DNS and DHCP and sysadmin work for 20 plus years. Uh, I have been with ISC for about three and a half years now. These days, I do a lot of sales engineering. I am one of the technical trainers for our DNS and buying course. And I uh, spend a lot of time teaching folks about DNSSEC and new features in bind in particular, uh, such as RRL. And with that, I will pass over to Jonathan so he may introduce himself. Hello, I'm Jonathan Allen, a product manager with Telesea Security. And I spend most of my time looking after Ironshield HSMs. I've been with TALIS for three years. My previous background is in the mobile phone industry, including mobile security. Excellent. Thank you, Jonathan. It's great to have you here with us today. Uh, we're also going to do a quick uh, presentation on uh, ISC and TALIS, just so everyone knows that we're on the same page. We have, um, we have a lot of folks that have joined because of their um, affiliation with ISC, and we have a lot of folks that have joined because of their affiliation with TALIS. So, I want to make sure that everyone knows about both organizations, regardless of their, their current relationship. So ISC is Internet Systems Consortium. Uh, most of you will know us because we are the makers and maintainers of BIND. Um, we also are the authors and maintainers of ISC DHCP. And we have a new DHCP server coming out soon that is called Kia. And if you have further interest in that, please do search for Kia. Uh, and isc.org. Uh, we think you'll be very excited about the developments in the Kia project. We are also one of the, uh, or we operate one of the 13 root name servers. We operate froot. We also do some public benefit hosting. And then our commercial services, uh, a little bit about those. Those, we, we fund the development of our open source and network services work through um, our commercial services. And essentially what we provide is subscription support services for those that are using our open source products in critical infrastructure. So those are available for both BIND and DHCP. We also offer um, a secondary name service and we do some training. So as I mentioned, I'm one of the trainers for our DNS and BIND course. We also have a DHCP course, some IPv6 training, um, and DNSSEC specifically. So uh, if you're interested in any of those, please do check out the website at isc.org. And with that, I'll pass over to Jonathan again for a little intro on TALIS. Okay, so uh, TALIS is a multinational company with the goal of protecting critical systems and infrastructure throughout the world. 14 billion revenue, some 63,000 employees in 56 countries. My group is Telesea Security, which is a few hundred folk in half a dozen countries, mainly UK and US. Uh, we're part of the cybersecurity group, which in turn is part of the security division. And just to close out the marketing bit, uh, we have thousands of customers around the world who successfully deployed tens of thousands of Telus HSMs in a wide variety of PK-related applications, including DNSSEC. Okay, cool. Thank you, Jonathan. So here's a look at what we're going to talk about today. We're going to do a quick DNSSEC overview. It's hard to talk about the value of protecting your keys without understanding a little bit about how DNSSEC works. 
then we'll talk about, uh, that'll lead us into the Jonathan's talk on the value of HSMs in general, and then uh, specifically the Talus InShield HSM. And then we'll talk a little bit about integrating BIND and the InShield HSMs. We'll have a little summary, and again, the Q&A part, uh, if you have questions, do send, us, send them to us uh, via the contact information at the end of this webinar. So, DNSSEC overview. Well, how many of us have trusted the DNS today? So I'm running a validating resolver on my laptop, so I've done a little dig here. So I've, I've done a dig at myself for internetconsortevents.webex.com, and I asked for DNSSEC information. Well, I've snipped out most of the answer, but what we really want to look out here are the, the flags that are returned to dig. And so this is a query response. Recursion was desired and recursion was available. What we don't see here is the AD flag. An AD flag means that our response was, or, or the, the data coming back was authenticated data. And that's really the flag you want to see when you uh, have deployed DNSSEC. So it turns out that most of us, at least uh, for this webinar, have certainly trusted the DNS. Uh, Internetconsorts.webex.com is not DNSSEC signed. So, if you attended originally our webinar on July 8th, you certainly trusted the DNS that day. So, but if we take a moment and we contemplate what if the DNS were to become untrustworthy for if any given period of time, um, you know, being directed to a webinar that's not the one you thought you were going to get is one thing, but if your bank or other important site gets redirected somewhere else, that is certainly uh, quite another matter. So the DNS itself is amazingly over 30 years old now. Um, the original design of the DNS really has held up extremely well. Um, the main concerns at that time were that it be designed to do delegation, that parties could control their own DNS, um, that it would scale, and it has certainly done that, and that it had minimal network impact. If you think about 30 years ago, the Internet was a much different place. Um, our internet connections or internet pipes, so to speak, were not as large as they are these days. Well, it turns out, though, that security was not one of the main concerns when it was developed. And so this has contributed to some issues that have occurred as the internet has grown. So I, I mentioned minimal network impact. So it turns out that a lot of DNS happens over UDP. And we're going to look at a little diagram, diagram here that we we'll see some of this. So it turns out that if I'm the user over here and I'm asking a question of a DNS resolver, then that resolver goes out and does some work on my behalf and contacts the authoritative servers for, a, for the query in, in which, uh, for the domain in which I have requested and gets back answers from those authoritative servers and responds back to me, the user, with what I have asked for. Now, I mentioned a lot is going, a lot is happening over UDP. So what this means is, for those of us that are playing by the rules, UDP is great. It means these queries are very fast. It means we get uh, queries are fast, the responses are fast. Everything is fast, and it means much less taxing work on the servers because there's no need to do the TCP three-way handshake. Now, what that means for those of us that aren't playing by the rules, though, is that um, our nice little attacker down here can spoof his address to appear to be coming from the authoritative name servers for a domain. So this gets us in trouble when we know what questions are being asked of this DNS server here. And typically, we do know what's being asked. We know things like Google.com, Facebook.com, in-adder.arpa. Those questions are being asked of most all DNS resolvers. So this malicious party down here can begin to spoof his IP address to appear to be coming from the authoritative servers for those domains and it can start responding to the resolver with answers to the questions that it knows are being asked. There are other ways to do this. Uh, malicious parties also can trick uh, the users, you know, via a spam message or something, to start asking questions of the resolver as well. 
regardless of all that, our, our malicious party down here begins spoofing responses. And there's some things that are that we've done in the DNS since its um, creation to make this harder for the malicious party. So things like uh, the large one that you'll remember is back in 2008, we added query source port randomization um, that makes this type of attack much harder. However, you can still do these types of attacks. Um, these days, again, they're much, much harder. And if you're using query source port randomization, it tends to make this attack um, very unlikely. But we added that in 2008 as sort of a, a band-aid to the real problem. And the real fix is DNSSEC. Um, so if we go to the next slide here, with DNSSEC, what we're doing is when we ask questions of this DNS server and it goes out and does work for us uh, and talks to authoritative servers, it begins to get back answers that contain signatures. And if it is a DNSSEC validating resolver, it can use those signatures to authenticate the data that is coming back to it. What this ends up doing then is if it receives data, that malicious person that was down here previously can still do the, can still attempt an attack However, if they get data into the cache that does not validate, then what will what the resolver will respond back to our user here is with surfill. So what that looks like to the user is that uh, the domain doesn't exist. So what that prevents is this part of the equation. So no longer is a malicious party able to redirect traffic to a site in which they want to uh, send you. So, and that was part of um, the, the previous slide is that the malicious party, of course, is not answering with the real answers. They're, they're responding to questions they know, they know are being asked, but they're responding with typically their addresses that they want you to end up at at a certain site. So very simply, DNSSEC provides digital signatures that will allow a va validating client to pr prove that the DNS data was not modified in transit. Uh, another way you can say this is that uh, DNS data is augmented with a signature. So how do we get these signatures and how do we trust where they come from? So a little bit about this. We can't talk about DNSSEC without talking about the chain of trust. If we think back to the good old DNS being 30 years old and one of the main design goals was delegation. And how delegation was achieved was through uh, an NS record. And most of you will be familiar with NS records. They're name server records. Um, and delegation name server records delegate authority for a domain to the party in which should be authoritative for that domain. So if you think about this, this is the, the usual DNS hierarchy that we, we take a look at and root always being at the top. So as if we think about the good old DNS, the 30-year-old DNS, the root servers have delegated um, authority for com dot, net dot to, to other name servers. And, and this works all the way down. And we do that via delegations with NS records. That's called the chain of authority. DNSSEC very similarly has what's called a chain of trust. And there's a new record that was created with DNSSEC called the DS record. This is the delegation signer record. And the delegation signer record is built off of the key material that you'll have when you DNSSEC sign your zone. You provide that DS record back to your parent, and the parent inserts it into the, the parent domain, and this provides the chain of trust through which a validating resolver can validate a response from a name server. So, well, how do we do these signatures? Well, we're going to be doing some crypto. Um, and in general, cryptography has four purposes. With DNSSEC, we're only going to make use of two of those. We are only concerned with, in DNSSEC is, is the message as it was sent, and did it come from the right place? So integrity and authenticity. And to provide these, we're going to use asymmetric cryptography and digital signatures. So asymmetric cryptography as opposed to symmetric cryptography. So symmetric cryptography is you create a key and you share that key amongst multiple parties. If you think about the DNS, that would be fairly impossible to do. There's no way to 
um, coordinate with all the entities that are making use of the DNS, and there's certainly no way to transmit those keys over uh, some secure infrastructure. So how we're going to do DNSSEC is with asymmetric cryptography. And the, those of you that are using um, things like PGP to encrypt your emails, then you will be fairly knowledgeable about this, this topic already. But essentially, asymmetric cryptography works with key pairs. You have a public and private key portion. Um, and so any data that's encrypted with one piece of a key can be decrypted and checked for integrity with the other. It is very unlikely that a person holding the public key would be able to reverse engineer your private key. So we, when we think about this in terms of the DNS, so here we have our uh, DNS data. And if you think about, in this slide, it's helpful to think about the top portion being the authoritative DNS servers and the bottom portion down here being what happens on the recursive DNS servers. So we have our authoritative DNS data here on our authoritative server. We're going to hash that data, and then we're going to encrypt that hash with our private portion of our key. So what this ends up being is we have then our regular old DNS data that we always have, and then we have a signature that's been added. This process in here, the hashing and the encrypting, is called DNSSEC signing your zone. What this allows for is that a validating resolver can then ask questions of this authoritative server and get back answers that include the usual DNS data that it's used to, as well as a signature. We can take that signature on the recursive side and decrypt it, uh, I'm sorry, hash it and then decrypt it with our um, public portion of the key that we provide. Uh, and it, ha it just so happens that we provide the public portion of our key via the DNS. It's a very handy way that we provide that. Um, if the two hashes match, then we know the DNS data has not changed in transit, and we know that it was created by the owner of our encryption key or our private key. Now, this kind of leads us into what we're going to be talking about today, is that you want to very much protect your private key. Um, anyone that gets a hold of your private key could potentially sign data and have it appear to be coming from you. So you, we want to make sure our pub, I'm sorry, our private key is very well protected. And HSMs are one of the ways in which we can do that. So again, we're going to be using asymmetric cryptography to guarantee that data has not changed and that the data has come from where um, it should come from, from the authoritative source for the data. So, and in summary, to, to sort of uh, make the, the good old DNS work with security in mind, we're adding DNSSEC to it. So, uh, domains are deploying DNSSEC, and again, you're ensuring authenticity and integrity. What you're not doing with DNSSEC is you're not doing any confidentiality things. The messages themselves are not encrypted. Uh, there is some work in the IETF going on or talking about um, confidentiality of DNS. That is separate from DNSSEC. Um, so the DNS data remains public. Uh, all we're doing is adding signatures so that uh, the DNS data can be validated. This also does not protect against uh, denial of service attacks. And here we have a little poll that we did in our original webinar, how many of you have deployed DNSSEC already? And so why are we having a webinar with TALUS specifically? So the TALUS InShield HSMs have now been integrated with the Bind DNS server. What this means is with the recent release of Bind 9.10, Talus is the only HSM vendor that we have validated with the native PKCS11 interface. What this looks like is Talus has a support queue that's very similar to our regular support customers. They're able to create tickets and interface directly with our engineers. So there are uh, or have been a lot of tickets generated and open that we have gone back and forth on um, to do testing and to resolve any issues to make sure that this works properly. Um, Talus has been really great to work with, and I, we've, we've developed quite a good working relationship with them. So uh, with that, 
we will pass it over to Jonathan, who will be talking with you about the value of HSMs and specifically the TALIS HSMs. And I'm going to Eddie, pass the presentation. Okay. There. Eddie, thank, there. You for, thank you very much indeed. Um, You're welcome. I'd now like to talk about HSMs for DNSSEC and also perhaps inevitably the value of TALIS N-Shield HSMs. So let's start by defining uh, an HSM. These are hardware security modules, which is to say that they are tamper-resistant cryptographic devices that must be isolated from threats that could come from the host OS or applications running on the host. In terms of functionality, we would expect um, an HSM to protect cryptographic keys from theft and abuse, to securely execute cryptographic operations, encryption, signing, time stamping, authentication, and simplify key management, creation, application, recovery of keys, particularly when we have large numbers, perhaps even millions of keys. Uh, we want our HSM to enforce flexible policies for how a key can be used, which key can be used by whom to do what, for example, to sign a record or transaction. And as far as possible, we want to delegate all security and crypto operations to the HSM. And we'd also expect our HSM to help ensure compliance with industry regulations. Companies like Target, who you'd expect to be more advanced from a data protection perspective, and indeed are audited by the payments card industry, are being breached. Around 100 million individuals are at risk because card numbers and personal information, phone numbers, addresses, emails, were stolen over a three-week period without detection, with each card's data being sold in the black market for $20 to $100 per card. However, an interesting point is that whilst encrypted pins are exposed, no pins were disclosed, proving that encryption works. Looking at the NSA, you might think that the NSA would know something about protecting data. However, they were the perpetrator of a surveillance attack, a surveillance scandal, and the victim of an insider attack. The NSA pressured internet providers to give them their encryption keys, and Edward Snowden, a contractor, obtained significant access to the NSA and was able to steal and disclose thousands of classified documents, including those detailing in the NSA surveillance programs. Heartbleed is an open SSL vulnerability that was introduced in a recent release. It's been described as an attack that keeps on giving to always allows keys to be stolen. We need to be aware that any vulnerability in our system will be exploited. A couple of quotes. If stealing data such as credit card details or passwords is the equivalent of stealing money, Stealing keys is the equivalent of stealing the machine that makes the money. And to combat these increasingly sophisticated attacks and to build confidence in their key management systems, all organizations should strongly consider using hardened and independently certified key management devices, such as HSMs, to protect their most valued data and critical security infrastructure. There are, as far as we know, no cases where successful data breaches have involved cracking the crypto or breaches involve failure of process or protocol or theft of keys. Given these concerns, it's worth spending a moment considering why we should prefer an HSM over a typical application security platform. Unlike an application platform, HSMs use a trusted and secure OS, which is isolated from the host or client server environment to ensure it's not susceptible to malware or insider attacks. An HSM provides protection against physical attacks and we can trust the quality of the random number generator, which is so crucial to generating secure keys. We can use the HSM to do what it's good at, i.e. fast cryptography, leaving more bandwidth for our business applications or for DNSSEC management. Administrators are strongly authenticated, and we'll come back to that in just a moment. And finally, an HSM provides audit records, which have at least two important functions. Firstly, for monitoring and alerting for unusual behavior, and then for forensic analysis, should a breach occur. The DigiNotar breach of a year or so ago would have been contained had they followed recommended auditing practices. So we need to consider two sets of administrators, the HSM administrator and the zone administrator. The HSM administrator is responsible for enrolling HSMs into a security world. We haven't talked about security world yet, but basically all the HSMs using it, used in a zone are likely to belong to a single security world. 
Uh, the administrator will be responsible for configuring the security world itself, for instance, security, uh, key recovery policy, uh, enabling HM firmware updates, network settings, and for creating operated card sets, which I'll explain on the next slide. So we need to authenticate the HM administrator to prevent super user attacks. To do this, we'll create what's called an, an, an administrative card set at the time a security world is first configured. Each HSM admin is provided with a card from the set, and each card has a passphrase known only to that admin. And then a quorum of admin cards, say three from five, is acquired before an admin function can be executed. Effectively, we're providing uh, two-factor authentication. So we now then need to consider the zone administrator, who is principally responsible for signing resource record sets. And this then is how zone administration authentication works. Uh, the HSM administrator will create the operative card sets that we saw a moment ago, noting that one set can secure one or many keys. An operator card is given to each zone administrator. Then, in order to use a key to sign a resource record set, the key must be created as a signing key, the key must be assigned to an operator card set, and finally, a quorum of operator cards, could be say one from five or two from five, from that set must be present before the resource record set can be signed. It's also worth mentioning another Talos product called SafeSign as an alternative to authenticating zone admins. Uh, this is a toolkit and framework for both authentication and signing, and it supports a variety of authentication technologies, EMV, CAP, VASCO, RSA, OATH, digital certificates, through any device, PCI, tablet, mobile. So let's summarize where an HSM is used in DNSSEC. So firstly, uh, the HSM generates the zone signing key and key signing key key pairs on behalf of the zone administrator, reminding ourselves that the quality of the keys depends very much on the HSM's RNG. Uh, the zone admin then uses the HSM to sign the resource record set to the private key, and then publishes the RR set digital signatures along with matching public keys in the DNS. And so in response to a user request, uh, the DNS server returns the signed resource record set from the address cache. And as noted before, the HM also provides key management, so securely storing public and private keys on behalf of the zone administrator, authentication of zone administrators, and logging and audit records for intruder detection and forensic analysis. And indeed, we have the option to log all transactions. Having spent a few minutes on HSMs in general, I'd like to focus on the Talos End Shield HSMs in particular. There are several aspects to authentication and a couple to mention here, are signing and timestamping. We typically use signatures to prove that an individual approves an electronic record or task, non-pudiation, that the record or task hasn't been subsequently modified, integrity. Timestamps, on the other hand, prove that the data, the record, the task, and the transaction existed before a given date. The combination proves when something was signed or something happened, by whom, and that it hasn't been modified. This becomes important for DNSSEC to ensure the transactions are accurately and securely timestamped. So in terms of products, uh, we have a variety of general purpose HSMs of different form factors. These are, however, compatible and can be easily run together in a mixed state of HSMs, that's to say within a single security world. We then have our time and sign products. Uh, these are for ensuring accurate and audible network time. And finally, all our products have FIPS certification. FIPS is the globally recognized standard for security products. It gives public assurance of the quality of the crypto algorithms, the random number generator, and of the physical security of the HSM. I'd like to spend a couple of slides on NShield's code safe. CodeSafe is a secure execution environment protecting a business's security sensitive operations. With a conventional HSM, both non sensitive and security sensitive operations are executed in the host's application layer, making them vulnerable to malware and insider attacks. CodeSafe, however, allows most, if not all, security sensitive operations to be delegated to the HSM. Business operations are implemented in secure code that can't be subverted, so code is run inside the NShield security boundary 
if your execution is tied to a crypto key. And of course, you provide a comprehensive CodeSafe toolkit and developer support to help you create CodeSafe applications. So here's an example that uses CodeSafe to securely deliver card pins to customers. It delivers the pins instantly. It doesn't rely on a postal service, which can be intercepted or subverted. And it's secure. The pin is never exposed outside of the HSM. We're using CodeSafe for two purposes. The first is to create a secure SSL channel that delivers the pin to the customer secure browser. And the second is to encrypt the pin with a symmetric key, which then allows the pin to be stored securely in a, in a database. And that means the, uh, the unencrypted pin is never exposed outside of the HSM. And of course, we'd also use the HSM to create a random pin in the first place. I've mentioned CodeSafe and this example in particular because it bears some comparison with the, with the DNS TC protocol, which we'll touch on in a bit. For the next few slides, I'd like to consider the requirements DNSSEC imposes on security and how HSMs in general and TELUS HSMs in particular respond to these requirements. As the adoption of DNSSEC increases, we'll have more records to sign and to verify. However, we can add NCL HSMs to dynamically balance the load as demand increases. And indeed, we can create a mixed state of edge, solo, and connect NCL HSMs. Offloading crypto functions from the DNS server to the HSM allows us to optimize DNSSEC performance, and in particular, to meet the demands for resource records at signing and verification. In fact, NCL HSMs provide the fastest RSA and ECC signing. We'll have more DNS servers to secure. Reliability is essential, and maximum uptime is ensured by NCL's high availability, failover, and disaster recovery, together with unlimited key backup and retrieval. Additionally, for NCL Connect, our network HSM, we have hot softball fans and PSUs. With DNSSEC, we will have more zone signing keys and key signing keys to protect and manage. We have centralized key management and storage for DNSSEC keys provided by NCL Security World. This allows us to replicate and backup keys across data centers using standard IT practices. And indeed, we'd expect Security World's centralized key management to simplify Bind's own key management. Strong authentication of administrators includes enforceable admin quorums to mitigate the threat from a single super user, the separation of duties for key management between DNS admins, HSM admins, and IT functions. And that in turn facilitates regulatory compliance. And of course, we need physical security. And to this end, TELUS HSMs use tamper resistant hardware that protects the DNSSEC keys no matter where they reside in the system. With DNSSEC, we need accurate network time. DNSSEC, sorry, DNS forgives inaccurate clocks. DNSSEC does not. We can therefore utilize TELUS NCL timestamp servers to secure network time and ensure its accuracy and hence avoid things like bad time errors. And almost finally, we have TSIG. TSIG is separate from DNSSEC. It's typically used to enable two DNS servers that are talking over the DNS wire protocol to authenticate each other. And in conjunction with dynamic DNS updates, it allows a client machine to submit changes to a zone. So TSIG will be used by a zone slave service to authenticate to the master server and vice versa so the master can securely, can securely transfer zone updates to the slaves. If we think of a DNS request as phoning direct inquiries, a zone update is equivalent to providing the entire telephone directory. You don't want, just, you don't want to give just anybody a zone update. Uh, comparison with SSL is interesting. Unlike SSL, TSIG uses a shared symmetric key to both authenticate the parties and to prove the integrity of the data. That means you need some out-of-band route to transfer the keys across the master and slave DNS servers. That means we should consider using NCL HSMs to generate TC keys and securely transfer them throughout the zone. So finally, having accepted that HSMs provide the crypto security we need, what performance is required? DNSSEC signatures are created and generated in advance. There is today no requirement for per request signing. However, a resource record set must be re-signed when a record changes. There are a small number of domains that are large and regularly modified, such as TLDs and second-level domains, for instance, 
co.uk. These may require hundreds and possibly thousands of signatures per second. Then we have corporate zones with dynamic updates. They may only need tens of signatures per second on average, can probably accept a few seconds latency. To meet these varying needs, Talisade ensure latency terms come in a variety of form factors, so USB connected, embedded, or networked, with a variety of performances, so up to 6,000 6, RSA signatures per second. So thank you very much. I'll now hand you back to Eddie to talk about integrating BIND with NShield HSMs. Eddie, over to you. Thank you very much, Jonathan. So switching the presentation back to myself. Okay, so we'll talk uh, very briefly about integrating BIND and NShield HSMs. So note that you can integrate InShield uh, HSMs with BIND 9.9. .9. Currently, we're at 9.95, uh, 9.96 coming out very soon. These are the very basic steps that you would do to integrate with the 9.9 .9 series. You install the HSM, install the InShield support software, configure your security world. You install and configure OpenSSL and then BIND. Then you can go about signing using the HSM. The OpenSSL, OpenSSL parts for 9.9 are that you, you patch the OpenSSL source for PKCS11 support. These patches are included in the bind distribution so that when you untar the directory, they'll be in your binder slash bin slash PKCS11. Uh, once you do that patch, then you configure and build your OpenSSL, then you can configure and build bind with PKCS 11 support. Uh, for example, using this example configure command here at the bottom of the page. Now again, we're part, one of the main reasons we're here today with Talos is that we've done a lot of work to have the Talos HSM integrate natively with the PKCS 11 interface. Um, so a lot of this is continuing the work to make DNSSEC deployment more simple. So there's been a lot of work in making uh, things like uh, automating keys, automating signing, those sorts of things uh, in helping DNSSEC deployment become more simple. This is another step in that direction of making the interaction for those that require HSMs to be more simple in their DNSSEC deployment. So these steps will look almost the same as with 9.9. .9. However, with 9.10, you don't have to do the OpenSSL patching part. So you again, you install your HSM, your InShield support software, configure your security world. You then can install and configure Bind and sign using the HSM. So to do this, uh, when you go to install bind, you run the configure command and you would use dot slash configure dash dash enable dash native dash PKCS 11 um, with the PKCS 11 path, uh, where the path is the, the directory of the PKCS 11 provider library. So again, you don't have to do the open SSL patching um, and this, this makes configuration and setup and uh, much easier and gets you uh, going much faster. So we'd like to point out some resources here. There's the, the Talus InShield integration guide. And so the, the general four steps that I covered are covered in much more detail in this document. And uh, we highly recommend you go out and check that document out. Um, we also recommend uh, a new book out by Michael W. Lucas called DNSSEC Mastery. Um, we one of our uh, one of the guys that works with us has was one of the reviewers for this book, and we we really think highly of it. We highly recommend it um, if you're going to be deploying DNSSEC, um, and it has some really good stuff on HSMs in there. Uh, and then we also always recommend DNSViz.net, and this is just a web-based tool that you can use to do DNSSEC diagnostics. And so with that, we'll go to our summary. Um, 
as as we talked about in the beginning, the, the DNS is 30 years old and it does really great things, security not being one of those. So DNSSEC was designed to address the inherent security problems in the DNS protocol. Um, there have been a lot of improvements to DNS over those 30 years um, in a lot of ways to make the security issues harder to um, harder to attack. Uh, and D but DNSSEC is the, the real solution to the inherent DNS protocol issues. So as we mentioned, the private key material is extremely sensitive and should be protected. And so using HSMs can further secure your vital key material. Um, and now with the native PKCS11 feature, Integrating bind with Talus InShield HSMs has gotten simpler um, and allows you to get going much faster than before. And with that, we're not going to do the questions because, as I mentioned, this is a re record of the original July 8th webinar. But if you do have any questions, this is how you can get in contact with us and pose those questions to us direct directly. Uh, these are the contacts here for the Talus eSecurity folks. Um, and then if you want to contact ISC, very simply, you can send email to info, I-N-F-O, at isc.org. And please do send in your questions. As I mentioned, the, the original webinar had really lots of good participation in terms of questions. And uh, we answered, I think, a majority of them, but there were a few there that uh, we wanted to answer afterwards. So if you're one of those folks that didn't get your question answered, please do send them to us directly. Um, and actually, if you did get your question answered, uh, please do contact us anyway. We'd like to, to talk with you and follow up with you about your, what your needs are in terms of BIND and um, HSM support. And so with that, that is the end of our presentation. So we thank you for your time today. And Jonathan, thank you. It's been a pleasure working with you on this. And do you have any final words, Jonathan? Uh, just to say thank you, Eddie. And it's been a very enjoyable experience uh, uh, discussing DNSSEC with you. OK, excellent. So thanks, everyone, again, for joining. And please do be in contact with us. Uh, be on the lookout for future webinars uh, on the isc.org web website. Thank you.